to tell you what not to do. So everybody's probably familiar with what a suspension is. Um, it sounds cooler when you say it dictates the path of the wheel motion, but what the most important thing is that it controls the forces between the tire contact patch and the chassis. Really, the tire is the only thing that we have on the road that's keeping us from flying into space-time continuum. Um, when you go out to our car, you'll, you'll see these lower control arms, upper control arm, um, a shock and spring, you'll see some rocker there, and these bearing posts. And I'm just going to kind of walk you through how we've arrived at this <laughs> assembly. Um, you know, it's interesting to say there's no single best geometry. And when I say geometry, I mean how this is all laid out in 3D space. Um, we went with a short, long arm because it gives us optimal tuning um, characteristics and because everybody else is doing it. <laughs> so what we start off with is a 2D sketch. Um, and we're going to iterate this entire process a thousand times until we arrive at these upper and lower ball joints um, locations. So as we know, here, it says adjust parameters to obtain desired performance characteristics. So what are they? Well, once we get the point from the wheel package, as Justin is just describing, we can work in from that outboard point and establish the lower ball joint. And then we are going to pick a roll center height, instant center height, and we'll also, use, using the formulas presented here, establish the front virtual swing arm length. All of these are conducive to the camber gain and roll. They also have to do with uh, roll coupling moments, um, reducing forces such as the jacking force, which we'll experience if you have a roll center going below the ground plane. So we're going to work through all this and try to come up with a way that we can drive down the road without the car flipping over. We we'll use um, a 2D sketch to transfer these points into 3D space. This here is, is our final suspension design. And basically what you have here is a front view, top view, and side view. Using these parameters I was just discussing, we will set up these points for each control arm. We'll do this in the front and the rear. And the desired outcomes, we will talk about in a second, but we're trying to minimize the roll center migration as the car goes through turns and acceleration and deceleration. And we're trying to maximize the tire contact edge. What here is we have Optimum K. It's like 3D kinematic software. We use this program a lot. We really relied on this this first year, and it's it's a great program for any SAE team um, because it's such an iterative process. You need computer simulation to simulate the cornering and the acceleration that you're going to be seeing on the track. These four points here is, or is basically what we're trying to optimize using this. Um, what you have here, this is our front suspension setup, and on the on the left here we have a motion roll and plotted here is the um, the axis roll. So as the body rolls two degrees in a turn, we can plot the roll center movement. We can also plot the camber gain. And we want to try to keep these as linear as possible so the car is predictable during a turn and that the driver doesn't feel anything that we don't want them to feel. Um, once we establish these points in 3D space, we'll translate them into model and it all of a sudden pops out looking like this. Um, the rockers is what we will move to next. The rockers is this member here that's basically three points in space and what it does is it translates the wheel motion into the shock absorber. Um, this is pictured as the rear rocker um, and as you notice our shock and also this lower ball joint point. Each one of these must remain in plane throughout the entire suspension motion. Um, that's because out of Plane forces will create bending moments and then that'll snap stuff off while we're driving. And what the iterative process here is we have to make all of this work with the chassis, packaging motor, which driver, the templates. And so we're, we're bouncing back between all of these processes and we're trying to get to a point where we can predict the motion ratio and get it as close to what we're desiring as possible. And once we have these points set up, we have decided on all the geometry, we'll move over and we'll start actually designing. So what we use is a finite element analysis, and we're trying to find out where we're going to have failure problems. Uh, we designed a factor safety of 2.5 on all of our suspension parts, and we use um, MATLAB programs to determine the forces, 
And then back to SOLIDWORKS where we get these cool little graphs that show the high stress points and we try to make it all look blue. Turn it over to <laughs> My name is Mike, I'm going to walk you guys through the steering assembly. Uh, the preliminary design, we did a bunch of research in the steering, and basically it comes down to three different geometries that you can choose from. You can choose positive Ackerman, which is pictured here, parallel, or reverse Ackerman. Now there's different uh, positives and negatives to each of these designs. Originally we designed for positive Ackerman because it allows for lightweight cars to corner very tightly around the track that we're going to see. And positive Ackerman actually makes the inside wheels steer more so than the outside wheels, so you can get around such tight corners at low speeds. Reverse Ackerman is just the opposite. It tows the outside wheel more so. And this is primarily used for higher weight cars with very thick walled tires that are being forced to higher slip angles. What we eventually decided on was parallel steer, and this was mainly a packaging issue. So every time Al would do a suspension iteration, I'd have to follow with the steering iteration to make sure everything didn't hit. So he put the, when we settled on our final rocker design, it was actually where the rack needed to be for Ackerman. So I had to move it forward, which didn't allow for Ackerman based on the wheel package. So we went to parallel steer just based on easy manufacturability and packaging, but it still will make the turns at the course. FSA rules dictates basically two constraints that you have when you're designing your steering system. Uh, you can have, you can't have the driver uh, head come two inches uh, into a plane drawn from the, the front hoop to the main hoop. And if it does so, you're going to fail tech. Also, you can't have more than seven degrees of free play in any of the steering linkages. So if you turn the wheel seven degrees and the wheels don't move, that's really bad and you, you're going home without even getting on the track. As far as packaging goes, uh, this is the wheel. If you're looking inside the wheel, the direction of the car is uh, to, to my right. The rack is actually positioned right about here. And this like I said, it was mainly a packaging issue, but it also lent the car more towards understeer, which is more predictable and controllable, which is pretty desirable. The steering arm itself, which is one of the things that is located on the upright and actually provides a moment, a lever arm, to actually steer the, the, uh, the wheels, we made that adjustable. So you can vary based on the driver's preference how hard you have to turn the wheel. So if you move it to slot number three, you're going to have this much. If you move it out more, longer moment arm, less force. This is a little more technical on how the geometry of the steering actually came to be. So you have to find what's called the ideal center of the suspension arm uh, travel. So the wheel actually doesn't go up and down, it goes in an arc. And if you find the center of that arc, you have to uh, put your tie rod, so basically where the rack hooks up, right there. If you don't, you're going to get errors in the, uh, in the steering as it moves into jounce and rebound and also roll. So the way you do that is, you take the black lines there, which are suspension arms, lower and upper, that Al has already designed. You project imaginary lines all the way out here to where they intersect, called the instant center. Then the farthest point that in the, over that way uh, in blue is the upright hookup. So that's the steering arm on the actual wheel. The next, where it says ideal joint connection, is where the rack will actually hook up to the steering arm. And uh, if it's done correctly, you actually won't see very much bump steer or roll steer. The way we account for bump steer and roll steer is using that program Optimum K, a very iter iter iterative process. Uh, you want it as close to zero as possible because if, if you go into a bump so the car will lift up, you really don't want to see the wheels just start going crazy and the, the car starts darting all over the place. So that's, you, you really want to get as close to zero. You can see we got it less than 0.01 in, in all of the cases of plus or minus one inch of heat, which is the most amount of heat we're going to see on the track. So the actual uh, bump steer is actually going to be a little bit less than that. The roll steer was also very good, uh, less than 0 0.01 also, less than 0 0.08 actually. Uh, but you can see these lines are very close to, to zero. After you go through all these iterations with Optimum K, it's going to give you your dimensions for your rack. Our rack was actually 11.24 inches long and a steering ratio, which is 6.41. So basically every time you turn the wheel 360, you're going to get 6.41 inches of linear motion in the rack. Uh, the input to the rack is a 5, 5 8 by 36 spline, which basically provides a really tight fit so you don't have any free play in the actual linkages. And spherical rod ends allow for the rack to stay perfectly straight and connected to the chassis with, and the, uh, the tie rods to, to move wherever they need to move with, this, with the suspension without breaking the rack loose or introducing any forces. I'm going to hand it over to Pete for the chassis. Hey guys. Um, okay.
Okay, so if you remember everything we just went through, we went through tires, uh, suspension, steering. Now we got to connect everything. So we got all of our subassemblies. How do we put it all together? Okay, so uh, as far as construction methods go, we had three options. We had the option to make a, a monocoque frame, a composite monocoque, or a tubular space frame. Now the benefits of building a tubular space frame far outweigh the uh, benefits of any of the other. The reason that we chose tubular space frame is because they have such a high strength to weight ratio, and we don't have the manufacturing capabilities to build a composite monocoque frame. A composite monocoque frame would be something like a carbon fiber tub. You have a highly reduced weight but also you need to have a high area of expertise in laying this carbon fiber sheet down. As far as the uh, steel monocoque frame, <coughs> which is really great for assembly lines and like manufacturers, um, we don't have any contacts here that can do that in the Jacksonville area. So we just figured that we would go with a tubular space frame and there's also decisions governing that based on the fact that we had a uh, little actual experience with building any of these. So uh, the benefits to a tubular space frame are that all members lay in compression and tension. Now I say that, you guys probably don't know what I mean, why that's a benefit. If you have any members in bending, for instance, your suspension points are going to get thrown off. Then that makes your handling of your vehicle unpredictable. And having an unpredictable car on a track is like having a death trap. <laughs> we don't want that. So uh, the material selection for the chassis, we decided to go with a 4130 chromoly steel. And the reason that we did that was because the company in Canada uh, called BR3 Engineering, they profile the tubing. What I, mean, what I mean by profile is if you have a tube like this and a tube like this, and they're both cylindrical, how do you get them together if you want them like this? What you have to do is you have to cut out a lip on that tube face, and that's a very tedious process that we had a company uh, who does this all by uh, XY and SOLIDWORKS extrapolation via into a coordinate measuring machine that can actually cut every profile identical to your SOLIDWORKS file. So all we did was send them our file and they sent us back a box of assemble, uh, tubes ready for assembly, which was a huge benefit because it allowed us for better design you can see by the complexity of this structure that this is not a first year team's car. This has got a lot of iteration into it, and we were able to do some significant uh, tubing processes due to the fact that we didn't have to profile the tubing ourselves. Uh, you can see in this picture, it looks like there's a color coded uh, bar over here. This is from SolidWorks, and what we did was we ran a simulated torsional rigidity test. You test a vehicle for torsional rigidity because you want to prevent or promote over and under steer. And this is just one of the simulations that we did in order to get this design. We chose to go with round versus square tubing also because that same company in Canada prefers that you get uh, round. Also, square tubing has high stress concentrations <clears throat> and is more likely to bend. And since we want to keep our suspension points we chose to go with the round. So the FSAE rules that govern the ergonomics and packaging of the chassis um, were defined in the handbook. And you can see right here that there's a display of a side impact zone. Uh, FSAE, they really take um, driver safety serious. So they govern other aspects such as the main roll hoop and the front roll hoop. And uh, you, even to get through tech inspection, they have to test your car out thoroughly. And uh, one of the main key points in minimizing load in your chassis is triangulation. Because triangulation creates more nodes. The more nodes you have, the more surface area you have to disperse force through. By increasing the surface area you have to disperse force through, you're minimizing stress. And uh, by minimizing stress, you increase your safety factor. And I'm going to hand it over to Justin to describe our chassis iterations. 